Welcome to Nepal Now, I'm Marty Logan. Unfortunately, Nepal's universities do not, in general, enjoy good reputations. Politicization is a main reason for that. But a new institution, University of Nepal, plans to avoid that pitfall by establishing itself as a public university governed by a board of trustees. More importantly, says today's guest and member of the development board, Dovan Rai, University of Nepal will offer a liberal arts education. Graduates will be well-equipped to deal with a broad range of future challenges, not only those contained within their field of specialization. To be located in Nawal Parasi district in south-central Nepal, the university could be opening its doors as soon as two years from now. Learn more now in my chat with Dovan Rai. Dovan Rai, welcome to Nepal Now podcast. Uh, thank you, Marty. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me in this podcast that I have been listening to for a while now. Great. I'm really glad to hear that. Firstly, I want to say that I, I do want to get an update from you about fundraising for University of Nepal and a possible opening date. But before that, um, tell me a little bit about how you got personally involved in this project. Before I get into how I got into this thing, let me first uh, tell a little bit why I got into this initiative. Uh, so um, I had joined uh, Pulchuk Engineering Campus for my undergrad. It, it was in the early 20, uh, 2000. Um, so Nepal was going through a lot of you know, political turmoil. There was civil war going on and anti-monarchy movement and all that. Um, and the engineering college that I went to, it was supposed to be the, the best engineering college in the nation. And I was really glad to have, you know, good pool of students and good faculty, but I felt that our curriculum was very limited because that did not teach us, you know, I mean, what was happening in the country or the world, I couldn't relate it to the education I was receiving. So there was some kind of, you know, this this kind of disillusionment and some kind of cognitive dissonance going on. And later on, you know, like, you know, I did my, uh, my PhD in computer science and now I work as a computer scientist. And as you can see, like, how technology has been such a uh, driving um, force. It's also actually, you know, driving the trajectory of the humanity itself. But uh, most of the technologists, uh, they are not well equipped to deal with all the, the complexity, all the noisy realities, complexity of the world. So that's why you, we, we can see a lot of these problems, you know, a lot of confusions and uh, this crisis. So, uh, because of all this, you know, my experience as a student, my experience as a professional, I uh, came to this conclusion that, you know, this very compartmentalized uh, education is not going to give a solution for the world that we are living and that we are going to see in the future. So that's, I have been such a big proponent of this uh, broad-based education, liberal arts education and interdisciplinary education. But, uh, but of course, you know, I was not on my own. I was not planning to start any university, you know, that was maybe I had wished that something existed like that, but I had not, you know, thought about that me being part of this, this kind of uh, ambitious initiative. But I really got lucky that um, some two years back around late 2018, I got to meet a University of Nepal team, uh, particularly Dr. Arzun Karki and Dr. Anu Subedi. And with them, I learned about this, the initiative, and they welcomed us. Uh, so I was really happy to join this. Um, the reason I got into this is like, one is, yeah, I really believe the, the pedagogical model, the liberal arts approach. But at the same time, I also really like the team behind this initiative, like not only Dr. Arsene Karki and Dr. Anup Subedi, but there are also people like uh, Chaitanya Mishra and institutions like Martin Chotari who, who was behind this. So that both of these things, you know, like uh, what uh, the initiative is going to be about and who is behind this, both of these things really uh, motivated me to join this. Okay, great. I wonder if we can probe a little deeper into the curriculum, because um, I understand that it's a liberal arts institution, and initially it will focus on, if I'm not mistaken, liberal arts subjects, right? Uh, let me clarify a couple of things. Uh, so, yeah, the, the name can be confusing, right? When you say liberal arts, it might think that we are only going to teach, uh, you know, arts and humanities subjects, but that's not the case. Uh, the liberal arts means more like approach. It's like it means the broad-based curriculum 
with the interdisciplinary approach, but the students are allowed to choose a range of subjects, uh, of course, from arts and humanities, but also from social sciences, physical and biological sciences, like physics and biology, uh, and, but, and also from uh, like technology and business, you know, and other more um, focused subjects like entrepreneurship. So uh, they'll not only be learning uh, arts and humanities, but they will be learning like a broad range of subjects. And they can also, you know, uh, major on, you know, certain, like, for example, you can go to a liberal arts school and you can major on computer science or you can major on business and economics so you have that choice the difference between uh, a student who has majored in computer science in liberal arts college versus a purely technical university is the student who majors in uh, computer science in a liberal arts college has taken other you know courses uh, broad uh, courses before specializing on that whereas maybe in a technical uh, college they only learn uh, the technical you know the technical subjects without having to pick from other uh, selection of topics and here also i want to um, clarify that um, because liberal arts has been especially primarily within the american education system but when we apply in nepal of course we are not going to just copy and paste the curriculum we are going to make it contextualized and we are also going to customize according to our uh, demographic need and also to where you know uh, uh, historically we are you know in this time and uh, is and for me, um, uh, because I mentioned why this liberal arts education or arts and humanities is important, but I think that this, uh, you know, uh, learning about technology and computer science and data science is also very important. So uh, I would really love to see, you know, the, the people who is majoring in journalism, you know, maybe they can also get some courses in computer science and data science so that they can also have more holistic understanding. So basically, the idea is to create, you know, more uh, this holistic um, knowledge uh, so that people have more critical mindset, you know, and a more holistic problem solving approach. So now this very compartmentalized education system seems to be the norm. And this more broad-based interdisciplinary education seems to be the uh, out of the norm, right? But I think that it's, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, it should be the other way, right? Because the way I see is like, because learning in this very liberal arts approach, having this very broad-based education, I think this is the more natural way to learn, the way we are, you know, Again, uh, this is not necessarily uh, universal Nepal consensus. I'm speaking uh, mostly from my own individual understanding. What I feel is like the kind of education system we have now, it is the the product and I would even say the vestiges of industrial capitalism, where we are uh, mostly focusing on economic productivity um, and and I'm not trying to deny the, the value of economic productivity, right? Especially, you know, um, having born and brought up and working in Nepal, which is a developing country, there's a lot of value of economic productivity, employment, uh, you know, uh, and prosperity. But at the same time, sometimes I feel like uh, our education system as of now, with an aim of specializing, it is making us stunted, you know, it, it is just reducing us to our like profession, you know, okay, I'm a doctor, I'm an engineer, you know, I'm a journalist. Uh, and I don't think that is a very uh, natural way of, you know, living, learning. And also, that's not also a sustainable way of contributing. And we are seeing it in our world today, you know, the climate crisis we are having, the environmental crisis we are having, and the technological crisis we are having. So I think this is all result of this very uh, siloed education we have. Uh, so that's why uh, we need this, this liberal arts educational approach, this interdisciplinary approach. I'm not saying that, hey, you know, other educational approach is not important, right? If somebody wants to start studying medicine right from the undergrad, yeah, it's good. You know, we also need a very a competent, specialized workforce as well. Uh, but again, as I said, there should be choice for people, you know. Uh, we cannot put uh, students in a silo as soon as they come out of, you know, school. Uh, and again, there is one uh, misconception about this interdisciplinary uh, education or liberal arts education is uh, somehow it looks like we are 
trying to create, you know, this jack of all and master of non people. Again, that's a, that's a misconception because uh, personally, I find mastery very beautiful and valuable. But in the name of mastery, in, in the name of optimization, in the name of efficiency, we cannot deliver, we cannot just make this very reductionist approach as the norm. I, I might be looking like I'm going round and round, but my gist is that uh, we need to be more open, open-ended. And I think we should give our students a uh, different choice, you know, how they want to learn and how they want to grow and how they want to contribute. Our goal with University of Nepal is uh, giving this uh, this quality education uh, with broad-based curriculum and interdisciplinary approach to our students so that they can not only be economically productive, but also, you know, they can flourish as an individual. You know, they can contribute to the society on promoting equity, harmony, uh, democracy, and also uh, promoting this global citizenship. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, can you give an update on how fundraising is going and when you think the university might open? Um, I was reading in preparation for this an article in the Kathmandu Post, which is basically where the only information I, I have about the university. Um, and it put out a, a figure of 250 million rupees. I don't know if you can talk about whether or not that's accurate or not. Before I answer this question, let me give you some disclaimer that um, uh, the university project, it has been conceptualized for more than three years now, but it has been a legal entity just some months back. I mean, that's also written in the Kathmandu Post uh, article. Um, so so what's happening is like we have, a, we have already done a lot of, you know, uh, conceptualization and brainstorming and building community around this and and uh, garnering the support and collaboration but at the same time because we, we had not been a legal entity yet so on that front you know we are lagging behind and fundraising is also one of those uh, topics that you know uh, we have not been able to really uh uh, built this consensus. So a lot of things that I might say today, you know, um, it might not be exactly accurate, but I'll try to, you know, represent uh, the common consensus as much as possible. So regarding fundraising, University of Nepal is a public university um, and uh, we are getting a lot of support from our government, uh, from all three levels, muni- municipality level, provincial level and the federal central level. And for example, we are uh, getting the land grant from the Gairakut municipality. So all this support um, is a is a you know a big contribution for us. But at the same time, we cannot rely because this is a massive project. This is a very ambitious project. We cannot rely on the government alone for all our fundraising. One is just like a practical reason, right? I mean. Um, we cannot, you know, burden our government so much. But at the same time, another is also we want to maintain our autonomy. So that's why we don't want to be 100% reliant on the government. So that's why we are looking at like a multiple source of fundraising. So uh, we want to fundraise through, you know, individual donations like crowdsourcing or also we want to reach out to uh, organizations for the people who are listening to this. I also want to make an appeal that if you believe in our initiative, uh, your contribution will mean a lot for us. Um, and regarding the timeline, I don't know. I, I'm I'm thinking that because we have only just started to you know like really do the uh, do this formal and legal work. Uh, it might take you know maybe um, two years to really start the university because we have to get the land, we have to build the institution, and all those other legal issues. But I would say that we might be able to you know deliver you know not other kind of service, even uh, before we really start um, uh, from the infrastructure, because now the online is also medium. So uh, yeah, we we would really love to give our service as soon as possible. But with all the logistical and legal issues in mind, it might take two years. And again, regarding the fundraising, uh, I want to mention one thing, and it might uh, also be a little personal opinion, but I'm personally a little hes- you know, cautious about the fundraising itself, especially about, you know, after the incident, the Jeffrey Epstein incident that came out of US, how uh, the big institutions like MIT and Harvard and Bill Gates, how they were all embroiled in this thing. So that's why this reputation laundering is also a big issue. 
but uh, we also need to understand that Nepal is a developing country, you know. Uh, so there are a lot of like a practical issues. We can be purist. At the same time, how do we maintain our integrity? I think uh, this is going to apply into a lot of domains. And I think fundraising is also going to be one of the early issues. Uh, and also one big update is in U- University of Nepal uh, Development Board. Um, so there is a committee, subcommittee, who is like uh, responsible for this fundraising. Um, and I think we can have you know more information from them. But for now, I would say that we are just like starting our uh, such activities. Okay, how would you um, describe a, a public university concretely? What does that mean? The names can be like the uh, the public, private, government, uh, you know, non government, right? It can be confusing. I'm I'm also like uh, like learning the nuances. So when we say that University of Nepal is a public university. It is going to be governed by uh, uh, by a trust. So the profit that we make, it is not going to uh, to the shareholders or or the investors or the owners of the institution. There is not going to be you know the owners. There is only going to be trustees who is going to give this guardianship to the university. So in that way, um, as a public university, the primary goal is in giving the the best service as possible, not necessarily maximizing the profit. But at the same time, of course, it has to be sustainable. There's a you know financial aspect to it. But uh, but yeah, by public university, it is a university that is dedicated giving uh, the best education, best service to the uh, to the students of Nepal, uh, without any regard for the you know profit maximization. So you mentioned that the municipality is providing a grant uh, of land for the site of the university in Nawalparasi. Are there other reasons as well why you want to situate the university there instead of, you know, the obvious choice would be Kathmandu because it's the capital? The decision we made to build this university in Gairakot municipality is like, a, I would say, in broadly twofold. One is based on our principles and our ethos and also practical concerns. So one thing is, uh, because Nepal is also transitioned into this uh, decentralized restructuring, and uh, we we believe in uh, decentralization and accessibility of you know service and resources, and uh, University of Nepal, of course, is not intending to give uh, the service only to certain certain uh, section of population or certain reason. So we want to reach out to the maximum people as possible. So for us, you know, choosing a venue uh, outside Kathmandu, we also want to convey a message. So how we are looking at decentralization and equity and accessibility and all those things. Uh, so Gaira Code also happens to be, you know, if you look at the map of Nepal, I mean, Kathmandu is not at the center. But if you look from east to west and north to south, Gaira Code is like, Almost not exactly, but almost at the center. And there are also other practical concerns is because like uh, our team had a good rapport with uh, the municipality and there's a lot of community engagement. Uh, and also like Gairakot happens to be a place which is not Kathmandu, but which is also not that rural, right? So we, we don't have to, you know, start everything from the scratch. It is right next to one of the major cities, Chitwan. Yeah, for all these reasons, setting up this university uh, outside of Kathmandu in uh, Gairakot was uh, an ideal decision for us. It makes it easier, I, I suppose, in one way to attract students from every corner of the country because it's it's going to be so central. And that makes me wonder also, is part of the the mission of the university or one of the aims of the university to do something about the number of students who are leaving to study abroad and some of them do return? but some of them also do not. I mean, is the so-called brain drain, is that one of the issues that you're trying to address with the university? Yes, definitely. Yes, definitely. Because what we are seeing is like a lot of, you know, our young uh, people are going abroad to study and they are like staying there. And uh, because we live we live in this 21st century and we all are globalized citizens. So we want to encourage that, right? People uh, studying abroad, people working abroad, you know, we love that spirit of internationalism. But at the same time, uh, what's happening is like not all the, the people who go abroad and stay abroad, they are doing it by choice, you know. They are doing it because there's no option here. So we want to provide that option, you know, for those students who want to get good quality education, but who also want to get it within Nepal, they should have a choice. 
right now it's it's not the choice between like staying in nepal or going abroad if you want to get some quality education there's a compulsion to go abroad so we want to you know get rid of that compulsion and also for the people who want to you know uh uh who want to return uh, back and do something so we want to build this very ecosystem of you know innovation and service and of course you know we are just one institution so we will not be able to you know provide uh, education for all and answering this question i also want to mention that sometimes we have this uh, dichotomy of you know uh, brain drain and the people who are um, staying abroad you know we sometimes want to paint them as a traitor uh and i think that's also unfair because a lot of people who are staying abroad uh they are there uh because as i said like by compulsion also they are contributing a lot even staying there abroad you know we have a lot of such examples okay. uh so in university of nepal we also want to you know um want to encourage the people who are staying abroad to contribute for example we are going to have this mixed model of teaching both offline and online uh and especially after the covid you can see how online education can also be a integral part of our education system so in that way we also want to open up the opportunities or this um infrastructure so that the 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 nepali academics who are staying abroad they can also contribute so the bottom line is not necessarily about like staying here or going abroad but basically you know creating this uh education system creating this innovation ecosystem so that nepali students and nepali professionals have the option to contribute locally nationally and also globally so it's basically about giving them the choice of contributing with their best potential okay great you already spoke a little bit about uh, the liberal arts focus of the university and you know we all know um that the existing universities in Nepal i think there are about a dozen of them um haven't for the most part performed up to expectations and a lot of that is because of political interference i know that you said according to again this article in Kathmandu post that university of nepal will be autonomous and what i'm wondering is you know what is driving kind of this mission is it the desire to make a university that will be completely autonomous and by being autonomous will be able to flourish and live up to its potential or is it uh, on the other hand to really create this model liberal arts university will do that will do all the other things that you spoke about earlier i would say that um, our primary goal is to give the quality education so uh, we want to provide this uh, this very exemplary pedagogical uh, model so that's our primary goal but to achieve that goal uh, our experience and our observation have told us that um, autonomy has been very important we are not trying to make any statement like saying that hey we are this autonomous entity you know and in our uni- university nepal initiative we have a lot of uh, veterans that like like the name i mentioned like uh, chaitanya mishra um, arjun karki you know who have been uh, uh, pioneers in building a lot of our existing uh, universities like trivandrum university kathmandu university and other universities and uh, from their experience we have found out that you know like yeah you all when you start a university right of course you you start with this very very uh, novel goal with this very ambitious dreams but what happens is like uh, where nepal is at its uh, historical political situation because we are this young democracy and our institutions uh, even though we are a democracy we have a lot of like a feudal legacy you know of nepotism and all that kind of thing um so we we are not able to institutionalize a democratic mindset in within our uh, political leadership and also within our institutions again and again we see that this very uh toxic aspects of politicization has like always seeps into our institutional framework so to protect us from those aspects you know for us autonomy is um very important and but again this is not to vilify our government or not to vilify a uh, political process in general which is very crucial to uh, to our democratic institution but uh, given you know how things are we have uh, found out that like uh, this 
autonomy from this political interference or this toxic aspect of politicization is so so fundamental. Just to follow up on that about the role that the government will play in thinking particularly about the central government, if I understand correctly, now the prime minister is the chancellor of every existing university. The education minister just automatically is what is called pro-chancellor. Um, does that mean that they will not have those roles in the University of Nepal? As I said, like our, our intention is not to vilify um, the government. Government is our ally. It's not our adversary. We want our government support um, as a guardian, as a patron. So uh, in that regard, you know, having the prime minister as a symbolic chancellor, that alone is, I don't think that it's going to be uh, a problem. Um, we, we can take it more as our asset, you know. And that can also give a good uh, message to the student body or to the, uh, you know, to Nepali community that, you know, we are not a private institution. We are a public institution with a patronship and guardianship from the head of our government. But yeah, we have to be really vigilant and we have to be really careful that that uh, guardianship role, it should remain as a guardianship role, right? It should not uh, infiltrate in other forms. So for that, I'm very happy to say that um, there are other universities like Madan Bandari University, uh, Yogmaya University and Gandhagi University. And there's a, like a common consensus among these new universities that uh, autonomy is very important. And all of those are public universities and they all are, you know, making this very collective effort uh, to uh, getting this uh, autonomy. So uh, in that sense, you know, like I'm really uh, glad that we are creating this this very collaborative, you know, uh, consensus even among these universities in identifying how autonomy is important for us. Dovan, thank you very much for coming on the podcast today and explaining this very ambitious project. I'm really looking forward to following progress and uh, one day in the not too distant future, stepping on the campus and visiting the University of Nepal. So best of luck in your project. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, so much uh, for giving this opportunity. Yeah, for me and also, you know, putting the word out. Thanks again to Dovan Rai for taking the time to speak with me today. You can let us know what you thought of our chat on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. We're Nepal Now or Nepal Now Pod. You can also write to me directly at marty at martylogan, M-A-R-T-Y-L-O-G-A-N dot net. If you're not already subscribed to Nepal Now, why don't you like, follow, or favorite the show now wherever you're listening to this? And if you think more people should hear the show, help spread the word by reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Thank you to Soraya Logan for helping with Nepal Now's social media. My name is Marty Logan. I produce this show, and I'll talk to you again soon.